have a, an exclusive agreement without doing any marketing, and that's fine. <coughs> that means without any signs, any posters, any social media. You want to start over and they're filming? We're filming. <laughs> ah, what do you want to do with this? So that we can hear you on the, on the mic. Oh. <laughs> Remember, listing agreements yes. all need a schedule A attached. <coughs> Not only is it attached and signed, it has to be completed. Filled, yeah, because you don't have a choice. You exactly. Have to, but, uh, yeah. The buyer representation it's agreements, the same thing. A listing agreement is a seller rep agreement, and so they want to schedule A, and same with uh, buyer rep agreements. They want you to put down what services you're going to provide to the buyer. Show the properties, um, evaluate the appropriate properties to show them, negotiate offers, Everything. discuss classes, whatever else you want to put in there. But you need to schedule it. Second thing is uh, <coughs> marketing. Remember the cooperation policy that came out a little while ago from CREA, which ARIA adopted and so did TREP, that you only have three days to market a property publicly. So you have an exclusive agreement, you put a sign in the lawn. Three days, and then it has to go on the MLS system. You can have an exclusive agreement and not go on the MLS system by not marketing it. Don't put a sign in the lawn, don't send out posters, don't put it on social media. Any kind of marketing whatsoever, three days is your max, and then you're on for MLS. Okay. I'm going to turn this over to our young man that came to visit us once again. So he's going to speak about assignments. Is that correct? Yeah. Oh. I'm also becoming less young as the days. <laughs> well, you know, lawyers, real estate, it's all you all age very quickly. Yeah. Very quickly. So assignments, as we all know, are popping up more frequently because buyers bought them when the rates were lower. And, and two things: the rates got higher. They probably make sure they've lost their job. Their circumstances change, and they need to get out of that paper. So they want to sell the paper but from the builder to a uh, third party, and there we get into the signing agreements. They're a little more intense and complicated. So, welcome, and thank you again. Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, no, it's very true. Assignments are uh, uh, complicated to those that have never done them. Uh, they're actually not that complicated. They're quite simple. Um, it, the the concept-wise, in terms of assignment, is it, a simple concept. The agreement itself, um, does not need to be complex in any way. You don't need a million clauses. Um, you know, um, it could be a very, very simple um, uh, agreement. Um, the only difference is, is that um, with many purchases, Schedule A usually is a page or two, maybe some representations and warranties, maybe some additional clauses that you typically see which you use anyways uh, for the most part potentially in an assignment agreement um, but then you add some extra things and we'll go through them um, there's not a lot um, which is why i say people get really scared of them but they're really not that scary i think the issues really are that are scarier more on the tax changes that constantly change and that's what we're going to talk about um, really we're going to talk about assignments but we're also going to talk about how it affects the specific uh, assignor or assignee uh, for tax purposes, okay? Because I think there's been some changes in 2022 with taxes, and I think a lot of people have, have completely missed it. And they're still doing assignments the way we used to do them back in the day, um, and they need to be done a very different way now for tax purposes. Um, mainly for the assignor, mainly for the, the person that's actually selling it, okay? Okay, so uh, what, sort of high level, what is an assignment? Um, it's essentially the right to purchase uh, a, a, a unit or a property um, that is that was originally bought by someone and is now selling it to someone else. So you're, you're buying the right of the contract itself. You haven't really bought a property yet. You're simply buying the right in the contract itself. Um, in Aurea forms, there's uh, what's called an, an options agreement, right? Kind of similar thing. It's the similar way of, of thinking about it. Um, so there, the, what are the components of an assignment? You've got the original agreement. This is the agreement that the builder signed with the original buyer. It's the big, huge thing. It's like 30 pages long. Uh, usually protects the builder. Buyers usually have no rights to it. We can do a whole new build <laughs> seminar on that. I think we did. No, no we haven't. Oh. But we can do, do a whole new build, new build seminar on that. 
Um, then you have the actual assignment agreement. This is your Aurea Forms 145 or 150, depending on if it's a condo or a freehold. You gotta, you gotta differentiate them, okay? Because there are some nuances in them about you know um, representations with respect to the condo and all that sort of stuff that are in that are not in a freehold, okay? And then you have typically the builder's form of assignment. That's the third agreement now. So this is where you go, you 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 sell the property to an assignee. Someone buys it from you. You do the second agreement, which is the assignment agreement, the order form. Uh, you make that agreement conditional on the consent of the builder, because you always have to make a condition on the agreement on the consent of the builder. The original agreement of purchase and sale does not allow any, buy, any seller to sell their property on assignment, unless you get the consent from the builder. Okay, so you always have to make a conditional, because when you make a conditional, there's a little bit of a legal argument that it's you, you've sold it without having to, we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit, but, um, Always want to make it conditional. Just quickly, that uh, the, uh, this builders uh, will, will allow. So it's already in the original uh, contract. We'll, or we'll go through it. We'll before, go through that. Yeah. It doesn't really matter. Even if you have an, an 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 addendum to the original agreement that allows you for an assignment, that addendum always has language that says that you always have to still get the consent of the builder. The builder always okay. has to know what's happening. Um, all that does is change the language from if we find out that you've sold it on an assignment. We're going to terminate your agreement mm -hmm. immediately. You're going to lose your deposits and you're done. Um, all that addendum does is say that we'll allow an assignment on reasonable grounds on certain conditions. You got to sign an assignment agreement, you got to pay a fee, you got to pay a legal fee. Um, you, in some cases, you have to do the assignment before occupancy 60 days, <clears throat> or you have to do it 60 days before the final closing, or if occupancies happen, we don't give it to you. You know, there's various conditions in those addendums that the builder basically will say, yes, we will agree to an assignment, but if these things are met. Okay, so it's very different. But either way, one of the most important things is consent needs to be made, which means every assignment agreement that you sell has to be conditional on the builder's consent. Um, and, and then so the builder's form basically just is between three parties, the original buyer, the builder, and the new buyer. Those three, those that's basically now the consent that allows this assignment to go through. Those, those are the three components of any assignment. Um, simple terms for the parties: a signor is the person that is now selling the contract to a new buyer. They're the original buyers, so they're called the assignor. Uh, the assignee is the new buyer that's buying the rights to this contract. It's called the assignee. <clears throat> and then you have the builder developer. That's part of the transaction. Okay. So those are just the, the high level concepts. Um, in terms of conflicting interests, assignors and assignees are literally on opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of rights. Okay, so you've got um, the assigner who wants, and these are more financial based type things, right? You've got the assigner who wants their original deposits back that they would have given to the builder. Maybe they put $100,000 down on a condo. Usually it's based on condos assignments um, they want those back right away right and then they usually you know maybe they're in some sort of financial issues going on with them or whatever the case is um, and they also want their their profit if they're making any profit on the transaction up front as well right they want all their money back so you're, you've got the contract I want my money now and then you've got the assignee essentially who agrees to pay or doesn't want to pay anything until the final closing day. You know, they, they don't wanna start giving people all, all kinds of money, um, you know, $100,000 deposit, $100,000 profit, now they gotta come up with $200,000 and they gotta give it to the assignor, and they have no clue if this building's gonna close or not. Maybe it's not even like halfway up the ground, um, might, might just be even dirt in the ground still, right? Like, who knows what the scenario is, but, you know, that's sort of the polar opposites. And you, and you as agents kind of have to find a way to get everyone back into the middle somewhere. Because you're never going to get people on one. I mean, you might. I've had some deals where I'm, I'm shocked at how they've worked out, where, you know, a signer gets everything. Um, but I usually find a middle ground's the, the appropriate path, right? So you've got the assign, uh, you, you get the consent from the builder. The builder says, yep, we're good to go with this assignment. A signer gets his original deposits. 
but he has to wait for his profit until the deal closes with the builder. I think that's a fair middle ground. I don't know if you guys agree with me on that, but I think mm -hmm. that's fair. Yeah. Um, and so when the deal closes, I don't know, it could be six months later, it could be two years later, uh, that's when they get their profit at that point. And usually the reason for this is cash flow, right? The, the, the assignor, or the signing, sorry, has to get probably financing to purchase this place. And it usually is financing at the full assignment price. And that's where the money usually comes to pay for the, the profit. <coughs> So, or a portion of it at least, maybe they may not have all of it. Um, and, and I mean, you could be creative with this too, in terms of how to structure profit payments and deposits and all that sort of stuff. I've seen where the deposit gets, the original deposit gets returned to the assignee and then, a, 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 I don't know, like a payment plan almost for the profits where it's like the next 120 days, if the deal doesn't close, we'll give you 20,000 and then another 100 days, we'll give you another 20,000 and slowly pay the profit as time passes until the final closing date uh, happens. It was a really interesting way of doing it, but I thought that was interesting. But um, so you kind of, you know, you can be creative about it. The, that, that part's okay to be creative. Um, and then, um, so, and then there's the adjustments. Okay. Um, this is where uh, it's very important when you're when you're doing an assignment that you you also have acted for this buyer at the time of closing or helping them buy with with the builder, because you also get an idea of what's been capped in those adjustments. Otherwise, you guys both kind of have to sit down and decide. Okay, what's been capped? What hasn't been capped? What is the assignee going to have to pay ultimately on the day of closing? And one of the biggest things with new builds is these adjustments on final closings that everyone talks about, right? Development fees. Um, and I think there's a, there's a big mistake out there where people think that, okay, the, the, the builder told me development fees are capped. Now, that's great, they might've been capped, but maybe the increases in those development fees weren't capped. Maybe the park levies, which is a separate thing, haven't been capped. Maybe the art levies have not been capped. Um, there's a new, uh, as of the past uh, three years since COVID, there's been these new clauses that have been popping up in these new building agreements that basically allow the builders to collect any additional fees that the city's charging them, trying to claw back some you know, expenses that they've paid through COVID and, and trying to get those back now. Um, so builders or cities will come up with new development fees, essentially, we'll call them development, they're not development fees, they're more like recovery fees. Um, so, you know, those could add up to ten, twenty thousand dollars in additional adjustments to a buyer on the day of closing with the builder. And if those aren't capped, the assignee essentially takes those on. So you don't want to go into a, an assignment deal where the assignee obviously has a right to review with their lawyer, and they usually <coughs> should. Um, their lawyer says, "Well, by the way, none of these are capped, and we don't know what they're going to be. They could be five thousand, they could be twenty thousand, they could be thirty thousand." And these people are already cash strapped and they can't afford another $20,000 on top of the purchase price. So, you know, you don't want to waste your time trying to market something that's not really easy to market, right? So having an understanding of the agreement um, and understanding what the adjustments are going to be or have an idea of what's capped and not capped is important here. Um, the easiest way really to do this is if you go to the Tarion Addendum, part uh, Schedule B, Part 1 and 2. Um, part 1 lists out all the adjustments that the builder knows the exact amounts for. And Part 2 lists out all the adjustments the builder has no clue what they're going to be. And then in there you'll see things about development fees, art levies, park levies, educational levies, and all kinds of other levies, right? And then you, you kind of look at those schedules, or those sections, and you compare them to any amendments to the new bill agreement where they've capped those adjustments to see if there's one that hasn't been capped. And it gives you a good idea of what the big caps are, right? Like development fees, increase in development fees, art levies, park levies. Those are the big ones, in my opinion. The rest of them are kind of smaller fees, tearing on fee, typical, uh, meter installations, typical. Uh, there are some projects that have given us some headaches over the past, um, year where for over 10 years 
meter installation fees have been a max of $1,000, let's say, per meter. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, these builders, there's a few here in Etobicoke, one specific builder, I won't name, name names, um, came with, and they were in the news, uh, came with uh, sewer installation charges and connection charges, energization charges, and some other stuff, and it was like $15,000 per unit. It was crazy. It never happened. I've never seen that before. It was just that one project. So uh, just kind of be aware of that. They, the builders could potentially. And I think that was more the the additional cost they had to go through with the city to do the connections versus the number of units in the project, meaning that there was maybe only, it was a townhouse project. So there was only like, I don't know, I think it was like 40 units or 50 units, right? Um, and I think the city made them go through some extra hoops to, to get it connected. So it was, it, was, it, was, it was a fair charge, but it turned out to be a lot more than everyone was expecting, really. Um, so those are. Now with these adjustments, I've also seen agents become very creative about this stuff too, thanks to our help. Um, basically, with a cap, with any cap, right? The developer says I'm gonna cap the, the, the uh, development fees at $10,000. So that means that you as the buyer only pay a maximum of $10,000 plus HST. And the builder covers the rest of them. And so what you could do with an assignee is say, well, as a sign, as a signee, these, <coughs> these development fees are not capped. So I'm only willing to pay $10,000. And if it turns out to be more, you, the assigner, uh, will pay for the difference. And I will take it out of your profit that I have to pay to you. I've seen that done. So it's like a cap on a cap. You know, it's like, um, or, or it's like self-capping things that were never capped by the assigner to begin with. And so if you've got an assigner that's struggling, needs to get out of a deal, really wants to get through this, um, you know, they might even take it out of their, like if it's being sold on a loss, they might even take it out of their <coughs> deposits that they're getting back. Um, so I, I've seen that recently and it's, it's worked. Um, just really depends on the scenario the situation. So just something to kind of, you know, keep in mind as a tactic. Yeah. But just to, to be clear, I, I don't understand one uh, one section. You said that the, the assigner, he has to first close the transaction? No. No, no, no. no. Ah, that's okay. No, no, no. The assigner, the idea with an assignment agreement is that you're selling the rights to the contract yeah. before closing, your final closing. What happens though is with some assignment consents, the builder will only allow the consent to the assignment if it's done a certain number of days before the occupancy or a certain number of days before the final closing. And basically they won't deal with it otherwise. So like you might miss your window. Yeah. I've had that happen where <coughs> the that specific addendum to the agreement that says you can do an assignment, we'll agree to it, as long as it's completed before occupancy. Guy takes occupancy, decides doesn't want the place, puts it up for assignment, builder then turns around and says, we're not agreeing to the assignment, we told you, it, it, in your agreement said before occupancy. Too bad, right? So now he's gotta go and close this, this property struggles, can't find a mortgage, lost a job, whatever the case is, right? So it's very important to um, read those addendums, understand them, what, what they mean, what is, it, what is the timeline that you're looking with or, or dealing with. Um, you don't want to request an assignment realistically within 60 days of occupancy date. Uh, builders are not gonna pay attention to you. They're too busy trying to occupy 200 units in a building. And no one's going to pay attention to your assignment at that point. So you want to really do it prior to prior to occupancy and, and well in advance, like months in advance. Um, or if it, if you're allowed during in between occupancy and final closing, again, you know maybe as soon as occupancy is kind of all finalized a month later, okay, maybe at that point, right? Because again, they're just not going to pay attention to you if you're doing it before final closing. And if, and if they do, they might charge some extra fees. Um, so if, you know. Give them enough time to kind of think about it and deal with it. Remember, they're dealing with uh, most builders. You know, they're not. These aren't full of staff. These people. They're, they're they've got like two people. They're dealing with two hundred units. You know, like that's not a lot of people. Um. So the Schedule A clauses. Um, things that you know you should be looking at. Um, conditional. Uh, clauses are solicitor reviews. Both the assignee and the assigner should be having these agreements reviewed by their, their lawyers. Um, you know, these are things, assignment agreements, 
um, although you might think they're complex, not complex, but I find a lot of realtors throw a lot of like clauses in these agreements that make no sense. Um, so, you know, um, trying to simplify it is the easiest way to do it and then it allows us to then add to it if we need to. <clears throat> um, that rather than trying to take three page schedule A and trying to work through it to figure out what's actually relevant and not relevant is more difficult. Um, so I always find if you simplify it and then we allow us to add to it, it, it does speed up the process a bit better and, and it kind of helps with um, uh, getting through the review stage, in my opinion. Um, disclosure documents, uh, so it should be con conditional on reviewing the disclosure documents. So the disclosure documents are the, the like 100, 200 page document that the builder would have given the assigner at the time when they first bought and signed the agreement. It contains the draft declaration, it contains all the bylaws, the rules of the condo, um, budgets, all that sort of stuff. And it's important for, for the, uh, we as lawyers don't review this, by the way, as part of our review for the assignment. This is more for the ultimate buyer to go through it themselves and decide, you know, based on the rules, can they do, a, can they use the property a specific way you know, or are they not allowed to? So, like, are they allowed to have a barbecue on the bil on the balcony? Yes pets. or no? Pets. Pets. Um, you know, what kind of size pet can you have? Can you can you carry the pet, or do you, or or do they have to walk? Oh. On, are they allowed to walk in the hallway? So that depends on the size of the pet, and you as an individual, can you carry your your dog across the hallway to the elevator? Because a lot of buildings don't allow you to take a dog in the common elements. <coughs> you got to carry them through the common elements for, for the most of the part. Um, which kind of limits you to the size of the dog you can get, right? So it's a, you know, it's important for them to read. I, I, me reviewing it doesn't help. It, this is between the owner and the building and what they can and can't do, right? If they have questions, they can always come to us. We can let we can go through that section and say this is what you can and can't do. But for the most part, it's they're simple stuff. They're not complicated things to read, uh, but they should be reviewing the rules on their own. Um, and and if it's a building, let's say that has um, a lot of amenities. There could be specific like rules around the amenities as well, you know, pools and gyms and all that sort of stuff. Like I don't care what kind of gym or pool things you bring into a pool, but you might. Um, so uh, financing, you should, you know, if a client's going to be buying financing, this is important. It was, it, you know, you, you want to make sure that um, the lender is okay with the fact that it's being financed through an assignment, being purchased through an assignment, right? Not all lenders will finance assignment deals. Um, most do these days, but you know, there could be like, depending on the lender that they're going with might not, then they got to go and find another lender now. And again, you don't want to be in a situation where you've got an assignment agreement that doesn't finalize because they didn't do the right financing condition on it. Okay. Um, building, uh, approval. Again, this is just the builder's approval on, on the, um, consent for the assignment. Um, with the consent clause, uh, usually, you know, most review clauses are like a few days, like five days, six days, whatever it is, seven days, uh, solicitor review, um, other reviews, financing, you know, but with the building consent, the, the conditional clause really should be uh, much longer because it takes a lot longer for the builders to kind of go through it and say, yes, no, they got to go to the lawyer. The lawyer has to draft the assignment agreement itself. Remember that third agreement I was talking about? Um, so I always recommend like 30 to 90 days is my recommendation typically, just because it does take a long time. Um, and depending on if you're representing the assignor or the assignee, that also could change, right? So if you're representing the assignor, maybe you wanna uh, make the agreement conditional generally on consent, meaning that there's no timeline to it. <clears throat> so that the assignor, you know, just deals with the builder to get this consent and the assignee is kind of stuck in the agreement waiting for the assigner to do it. And the assigner can back out at any point if they don't get the consent rather than worrying about a deal just becoming null and void because the 30 days has passed. So I kind of like that clause for assignors because it, it gives them the flexibility to deal Would with the builder. Has any ever agreed to that? I have, yeah. Signees really? have agreed to it, yeah. If they really want the property and they know it's a great deal, they will stick through it. Um, it depends. It really depends on the, on the deal itself. Um, but either way, Right, like either 30 to 90 days, um, I find as a good timeline. Um, and then um, 
One of the things I find, uh, so we'll, so I, I know it says, just ignore that, <laughs> closing date. It's schedule A, some of the other things are in the bullet points there in bold. Okay, so one of them being the closing date. There is no specific completion date in an assignment agreement from Oria, which means that the deal closes on the final day of closing with the building. <coughs> And if you don't want it to close on that day because you want deposits and profits released on a specific day and you want this contract closed on a specific day and you want to get paid as a realtor um, on a specific day rather than waiting until final closing, then you've got to mention the agreement that there's an actual closing date for this assignment. You have to specifically write a, 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 a clause in the agreement that says this is going to be the completion date. So you can close it before the closing? Before the final closing, yeah. yeah. Um, so if, if the deposits and the profits are going to be paid on the final day of closing, meaning that's the last payment, that's when the last payment is going to happen on the final day of closing, then you could simply just write that the property is going to comp, the, the agreement will contemporaneously close with schedule C. Schedule C is the builder agreement, right? So on the final day of closing. It's a simple, because that's you know that that's when it's closed, that's when you get paid as a commission as well. Um, you could also do it where it's kind of like an occupancy in the sense that you have two closing dates the way you have with the new build agreement. So you have uh, closing date number one, uh, you call it the occupancy closing, assignment occupancy closing, um, is the five days after the builder consents to the assignment. This gives us a time to do some documentation between uh, uh, a signer lawyer and a signee lawyer. Uh, there are some documents that we have to sign. And then things like the non-resident affidavit, right? That still applies in, in this type of a sale. So we need to confirm if the signer is a resident of Canada or not. Otherwise there's non-resident tax. Um, and then just an undertaking for taxes. We wanna make sure, we'll talk about the taxes, but we wanna make sure that the signer pays their taxes that they need to pay. So there's an undertaking for that. Um, these are things that are required as part of the agreement, right? And a lot of lawyers actually miss to get those signed as part of the assignment. It's like, oh, assignment closed, here's some money, and then, then they're done. But there's actual documents that need to be, it's, it's like a closing. It's like a sale and a purchase. There are things that need to be done between a signer and a signee and their lawyers. So I always like giving us like at least four or five days to kind of transfer money, deal with the signings, we've got to sign documents, we've got to arrange ourselves for appointments, you know, all that sort of stuff. Uh, so that's occupancy closing number one. And then you have a final closing <coughs> that's when the, the profits are going to be paid. So you're kind of stating when everything's closed. You've got to state in your, in your schedule when things are closing, when things are happening. When is this, the uh, uh, deposits or those deposits <coughs> being reimbursed? And when is the profit being reimbursed? It's got to be mentioned in schedule A. Otherwise, no one knows. It's, it's just like a mystery. What about commission? On the assignment. Uh, on the commission. So the commission typically will get paid on the final closing. But again, you can put a clause in that says if 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 you want, you can have the commissions paid after the first occupancy assignment closing, which is when the builder consents. So like when that closing happens, also the commissions get released. There's a clause you can put in for that. Um, well, our interest is obviously to be paid. But then, okay, <laughs> it, because there's the situation, okay, the, 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 the first transaction with the, with the, with the assigner, yes? Let's say that he had, a, he had an agent, because some builders sometimes pay commission, mm -hmm. yes? So the, the first agent, uh, let's say, was paid uh, out of, let's say, 6%, okay, the first, like, they, we pay you 2% just now, and the rest on closing, yes? Yeah. So this first agent already got the, some money, yes. But that's, now, that's, now that's separate. But that's irrelevant to you. Yeah. That's irrelevant to you. That's that's his. So deal. who is paying the commission now? Now on the second assignment. We're, we're on talking the about assignment. on the assignment is the commission on uh, between a signor's agent and a signee's yeah. agent. So what, so what so the so the buyer said. number one and buyer number two. Buyer number one is the original buyer from the builder, and then they are selling the paper to buyer number two. So a signor is paying, yes. A signor would pay the listing agents. Listing brokerage. Listing brokerage commission, yes. Oh, I see. Yeah, and then and and if whoever represented that buyer when they bought with the builder, if they're owed commission, that has that's nothing really, to do. Okay. okay. That, yeah. That's with them and the builder. Whenever the deal closes, whenever their deal was to get paid, that's when they get paid. Too bad. Yeah. Yeah. It has nothing to do with you. Yeah. 
what you're concerned about is, uh, is the transaction, the assignment transaction itself. Listing agent always pays it, right? That's the standard with any real estate transaction. And um, the question is, is when do those re the, the commissions get released? Is it when the builder consents, or is it on final closing, or is it a combination of the two? Maybe it's like half half. You know, maybe maybe the co-op gets paid on occupancy, but you know half of it gets released, and then the other the listing waits until the final closing like, because they got to get some extra money or whatever the case is. Um, because also there might not be enough money. Right, depending on how bad the loss is on the assignment. Um, so the agent would be acting for both parties, so the original purchase and the assignment. And and the assignment as the assignor's right. agent, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And they get paid double, double, sure. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Or triple, <laughs> depending on what you agree to. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But, um, we're talking about the profit, but do, do you have cases where there pretty much there's a loss? Yeah, we can talk about it in, in a little bit. Yeah, there, there are at the moment that's basically the only thing that's happening. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so important completion date, <coughs> different ways of structuring it, but there needs to be a completion. You need to mention the agreement what a, what the defi definition of what a completion date is going to be, because that then decides when the specific monies are paid. Are they paid on like half half? You know, like are we doing deposits first, profits later? It's very important. Again, I think almost eighty percent of assignment agreements that I read fail to do this, and I always have to go and fix it. So I think it's important that you guys put it in. Okay. Um, extension permission. This is basically where um, you know. I mean, it could be assignee or signor, but uh, assignee requests. Um, or so it should. It should actually be the assignor, um, where the assignor requests more time to get the um, consent from the builder. So, in your conditional agreement, in your oh, sorry, in your conditional clause to get consent, you may want to add wording in there that the assignor has the ability to extend the conditional period by another thirty days if it's not obtained within the, the first thirty days or ten days or whatever. Kind of gives them a, a, a unilateral right just to say, okay, here's my notice. I need another ten days, right? Or just have a longer time limit, as you Or should. just have a longer time yeah. limit. That's why I said 30 to 90 days is really kind of a good limit. Um, if you want to do it 90 days, 90 days is what I usually typically see. Um, and then it gets done usually before the 90 days. But uh, it's just nice to have that extra time. That's all. Because you don't want to go back and then the assignee is like, no, I want to back out of this. I don't want this anymore. I, I've changed, changed our heart. I don't, I don't want to do this. Prices have slipped further. I don't know. Whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, clause for prorating occupancy fee adjustment. So this is important where occupancy has already happened and now we're doing the assignment. Okay. You've now gone ahead and tried to sold it, sell it through assignment after the occupancy has already happened. You essentially want a clause in there that talks about adjusting uh, the occupancy fees. So there's no standard wording in ORIA for that. So you got to put it in. You got to put it in. Most people don't, most builders don't allow it during occupancy. There are, there are some that do. Yeah. So it's important just to kind of mention, okay, as part of our adjustments to an assigner or assignee, there needs to be a prorated amount of documents because the assigner would have paid at the beginning of the month, assignment closes at the middle of the month, but they've already paid like nowadays, on average $5,000 in occupancy fees a month. Which is great. So yeah, and so you want to get that $2,500 back to him or her, okay? Uh, indemnity clause, I, I feel every, every agreement I ever read forgets to do this. Um, so you want to have an indemnity where the assignor indemnifies the assignee for anything that they might have defaulted or done prior to the assignment completion, prior to the consent, whatever the timeline is. Um, and the idea here is maybe they gave a deposit check that bounced at some point, and then with bounced checks, there's usually like a $350 fee that the builder charges on the final day of closing. It's not the assignee's responsibility to pay that. It's really the signer's responsibility. And you don't want to have arguments to figure out on the day of closing who's going to pay that $300 fee. Um, so I think it's important to have that indemnity clause. You know, whatever costs associated with the assignment that the assignor did or, or defaulted on should be their responsibility, right? So when you're acting for the assignee, you want to make sure that happens. And then as the assignor, the assignor should be indemnifying the, uh, or sorry, the assignee should be indemnifying the assignor for anything that they do after the assignment consent is obtained. Okay, so, you know, if they default somehow, 
the, the way it works is if, if, the, if the assignee doesn't close with the builder, the assignor steps back in to close the deal with the, assign, with the builder. They're not relieved of their rights under the assignment agreement. They're still responsible until the final deal closing to the builder to make sure this deal closes. They're almost like a guarantor. Okay, so if, if the assignee doesn't close the deal or, you know, you gotta, you gotta have some sort of indemnity there that protects the, um, the, uh, the assignor. Uh, now there's some language in the ORI agreement that, that refers to that sort of stuff, that, but it basically means that the deal just kind of dies. And I, I don't like that. I think a, a reciprocal indemnity agreement is important for both parties. We have standard language for all this stuff. If you need help with it, you know, it's your first time doing an assignment, we have standard language that we can help you out with. Okay, so some examples, some numbers. Buy the sell is complicated. Everyone seems to forget how a calculator works on this form. I don't know why. Um, it's really simple math here. So, <laughs> um, so we have the first line, the first number. So there's there's six numbers in Schedule B, right? Number one is what is the assignment price, right? So I just put some numbers here, 500,000. Number two is what is the original price from the builder? Okay, this includes, um, you know, if there was an, a, an amendment that reduced the price, increased the price, maybe they bought a parking spot, changed the price. You gotta remember about those things and add them together, right? Because it's not just what the page on the front page of the agreement is. Things would have changed along the way, potentially. Right, so you gotta look at those other amendments to make sure that there isn't a change in the price. So what I find is we, we come here, we put a price in here, and then as lawyers, we start to review it and there's an amendment where the guy bought a parking spot and increased the price by like $25,000, right? And now it's like, oh, well, I just reduced my profit. <laughs> Does that include like uh, upgrades to the uh, Yeah, finishes? so uh, upgrades are not part of the purchase price unless they uh, change the purchase price. And then <clears throat> upgrades are typically a payment that you as an assignor paid to the builder directly or agreed to pay on final closing. As part of the assignment agreement, if you expect to have a reimbursement for that, it needs to be added in Schedule A or increase number one by whatever that amount is. Increase the assignment price. Otherwise, you lose it. If you agree, if you paid uh, $20,000 for this fancy kitchen, that $20,000 payment is already included in the $500,000. So if you want it back, you have to increase this by $20,000. Okay? So any upgrades, special payments that you're making or that you've made that you expect to get back should be part of the purchase price. Okay? Um, Number two, it should be the disclosed somewhere where, where uh, that the original buyer like paid extra for the kitchen, whatever. That has to be kind of uh, officially communicated. Yeah, yes, yeah. Because yeah. It, it would be in an amendment. So this is important. Why you ask if you're if you're active for the assigner? Like before we list this. Okay. What have you paid that you expect to get back as a reimbursement on top of the purchase price, right? Uh, so we can add it. We can think about this as we're selling it and looking at a price. What price are we actually going to sell this for? And what is our ultimate profit going to be? Right? Or loss. Um, and so then number three is the original deposits <clears throat> that you expect to be reimbursed as an assignor. Again, this includes potentially any payments to credits if you expect to get that back. Um, so this is important. And then there's this line here, this dotted line. And I, I, and I have no idea why people forget to do this. But this dotted line has to be filled in with one of these options at the bottom here. There's three options at the bottom. You want the original deposit to be paid to you um, once the consent is given by the builder. You want the original deposits to be paid to you when the final closing happens. Or as otherwise stated in the agreement, that's the third option which is where we go back to our original example, if we're restructuring the way the original deposits are paying, meaning that they're gonna be paid, part of, them, part of the original deposits are gonna be paid on consent, and part of them are gonna be paid maybe 30 days later, you, you put as otherwise stated in the agreement, right? And then it's in Schedule A, discusses how the original deposits are gonna be actually paid. If they're, if they're gonna be split, if they're not gonna be paid on those two days, either consent from builder 
for final closing, right? So you gotta, but you gotta put something here. You can't just leave it blank. You gotta actually write it in, right? <laughs> Um, and then number four, <laughs> five, and six are dealt separately from the rest. Th these aren't like, this isn't a, a, a continuous formula here. And I don't know why Aurea does this. I, I, I think they should fix this form a little bit, personally. Um, number four, essentially, is what is, what is being paid for the assignment, okay, which is essentially the profit portion okay so here your profit is a hundred thousand dollars right we sold it for five we actually paid four hundred thousands our deposit hundred thousands our profit so we put a hundred thousand dollars number four that is our profit portion that we're paying for this assignment mm -hmm. and because remember deposits are being dealt with separately it's a separate calculation okay and then uh, number five is what is the deposit that was paid to secure this assignment agreement, right? On page one, you have to pay a deposit to secure the assignment agreement. So that could be, let's say 20,000, okay? So 100 minus 20 is 80. So on the day of final closing, the assignor, or whenever the profit has to be paid to the uh, assignor, um, gets 80,000. So is that the assignment fee, 20,000? And assignment. assignment the, the, the twenty thousand is the deposit is a good thing. to secure the assignment agreement. Okay. Right? Deposits for any agreement. Think about it as like a purchase sale. It's mm -hmm. the same idea. It, it's you as the assignor want this deal, and I'm going to give you twenty thousand dollars to show you that I'm I'm serious about this. Right? The higher the deposit, the more serious the assignor the yeah. assignee is. And in rule, the, not rules, but any kind of because. Usually, not typical transactions, a minimum 5%. For example. Yeah, yeah. Here's so, you follow out. the same rules you would in a normal purchase and sale transaction, right? The idea is you want to have enough money there to cover the majority of your commission yeah. rates oh. between, uh, between co op and that's, listing. Thank you. That's, um, that's a general rule on any purchase agreement. Yeah. Now, if, if the, the, the transaction's a big, big value, right? Like you've got a, a $2 million deal or a $3 million deal. <laughs> then the higher the deposit, the better, because it shows that the assignee is serious about this purchase, right? And and the higher the deposit, the better it is for you as an agent and for the assignor, because if, if it all goes to, like, shits, uh, essentially you have some money there that you can use to sue these people. <coughs> because any lawsuits, we talked about this I think last time, any lawsuits, the damages that the, the seller gets usually comes out of the deposits first. And so you want to know that if I'm going to spend $30,000 to a lawyer to sue someone, that I'm going to get at least $30,000 back, right? Because they, they, they come out of that deposit. So the higher the deposit, the better. What I find though with assignments is, I don't know why, but they're always like twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 only. I have no clue why. Um, but the higher the deposit, the better. I guess it, it really mm -hmm. depends on how, how much money of the original deposit they have to give. You could always match that in some ways. You could always say, I'll give you 75000 That's the original deposit you put down. I'll give you 75000 to confirm that. Wait, so deposits are handled later, right? To, yeah, because it's it's when the consent is given, okay. usually, the assigner gets their original deposits back when the consent's given. Okay. And that reduces, like, I mean, you could put 75000 here, consent's given, they get 75. But if you're the, if you're the assignee, the less money the deposit, the better for you. Absolutely, yeah. As a assignee, the less money you give, the better. As a signer, the more money you get, the better. Like, right? like a regular deal. Like a regular deal, yeah. So, one, two, three, dealt separately from four, five, six. This is also very important with um, the new HST rules. Okay? So, we'll come back to it. Okay, we'll come back to it because I think it's important to understand it visually as, as well, mathematically, why it's important. Um, so pros and cons for the assignor. Um, so basically, you know, the assignor doesn't have to pay any occupancy fees, they get out of the deal. You no longer have to worry about the five, six thousand dollars of monthly fees that they gotta pay. Um, assignor doesn't have to pay any closing costs, right? All those adjustments and everything else, my transfer tax, they don't have to pay any of that stuff. They just get their profit, if they're making a profit, and that's it. Um, they don't pay my transfer, they don't, they, they get a return of their original deposits back, 
usually. That's how that deal usually works. Um, any potential profits that they make. And then if they're first time home buyers, they also get to save their first time home buyer eligibility because they never went on title to any property. The minute you go on title to the property, whether you have uh, an interest in it or not, you lose your right to the first time home buyer rebate. Um, and they don't have to worry about this infamous HST rebate um, because they're not buying the property. It's the, the new buyer that has to worry about it. Cons for them, um, they remain liable for the closing with the builder. So if the assignee doesn't close the deal, they're still very much responsible for closing with the builder. I've had, in all my years, maybe one deal where that happened, where the assignor had to step back in and, and close the deal with the builder. We had to get an extension. There was, I don't know, like $15,000 in extension fees, because when you're dealing with the builder, yes. the cost to extend are not you know, $50 <laughs> a day. They're like hundreds of dollars a day. Um, and when you're stepping in to purchase a home and you have to get a mortgage and a thing, you need at least two, three weeks, potentially a month, you know, it, it becomes a problem. Um, they, uh, they, they, many times, like I said, the middle ground is where the assignor gets their profit on final closing. So they got to wait to get the profit. They get their original deposit, but they got to wait for their profits. Um, they have to pay capital gain on the profit, so there's a capital gain tax, and depending on if they're considered a serial investor, could be considered as part of their income, the way the CRA taxes it. So it's either you're taxed as income or you're taxed as a capital gain. Okay, so it's, it's very important that they speak to an accountant to understand what sort of tax implications they have on there in terms of taxes when they have to file their taxes. Um, so, you know, capital gains could be quite a lot of money that they gotta pay. It's not as common now. Like a hundred thousand dollars, general rule is half of it is taxable at the highest tax rate, fifty percent. Call it, you know, a hundred thousand dollar profit. You're looking at a fifty percent, twenty five percent. So like a twenty five thousand dollar tax. So your hundred thousand dollars now became seventy five, and then you got to pay, I don't know, thirty thousand dollars in commissions. You're less than fifty thousand dollar profit now. Right. So, so this kind of thing is it regardless whether original. Is this is where the tax changes happen. Yeah, because yeah. everyone was trying to avoid this capital gain. No one was telling anybody that I sold this property, and now CRA is like, no, no, no. Yeah. Everyone needs to tell us when you do an assignment, and everyone needs to pay tax on it on the profit. Yeah. And we're going to make it even worse for you guys. If and we'll get to this in a second. If you didn't put a specific clause in there, you're also going to tack on the original deposits to the calculations that you need to pay, and you got to pay HST on that too now. So there's 13% HST, there's capital gain, and wow. it's, like a, it's like a zero profit almost at the end for most of sign -ors. That's already in the law? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's been in place since 2002. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, this is the right? Huh? So the assignor gets also... Assignor has to pay HST, and they have to pay a, a capital gain on their profits. HST and <laughs> capital gain on their profits. On their profits. <laughs> Or potentially, if you're a serial investor, it's tacked on as your income, right. which is worse than capital gain. Because now you're paying like 40 yeah. something percent, 48 percent, or whatever it is. Right. Yeah. Well, but I, I, I don't understand one thing. It was, okay, a sign or this is a typical, like the, it's not the kind of investor or any bill. No, most people it's, are just the one residential person. sale, yeah, because HST technically is. is, is uh, uh, the the rebate is because he declares that he wants to move in. Yes, he wants. Uh, to. Uh, but HST rebate is different than HST. Sorry, HST rebate is different than HST on a tr on a sale of, a, of an assignment. That's right. Two different things. Yeah. HST rebate is is part of uh, a new build program that the CRA has created, which says when you're buying a new build, the price of that build includes HST and will give you a rebate. Back. So the, the, the first page of the agreement, if it says five hundred thousand oh, dollars, it already includes HST because the builders have to charge HST to build a new construction, and then they deduct. The CRA says we'll deduct a portion of HST, uh, uh, like a small portion, twenty four thousand, um, and the builders give you a final purchase price, which is unit cost plus HST minus rebate. That's the five hundred thousand. That's the formula. 
And in order to qualify for that rebate of the 24,000, you have to live in the property as your principal residence and you can't rent it out, can't do Airbnb or any of that stuff. You have to live in it as your principal residence and you're qualified for it. And if you're not qualified for it, you have to give that $24,000 back to the builder on the day of closing. So this is the issue for the assignee. The issue, assignee has to worry about that. We'll get to that in a second. Um, <coughs> so it's, it's, that's different than HST on the transaction itself. So the way they've changed the rules is an assignor is considered, uh, it was very convoluted before. It was like, are you a builder or are you not a builder? Maybe you're a builder, maybe you're not a builder. If you did it only one time, you're not gonna be a builder, but if you do it multiple times, maybe you're a builder and so you gotta charge your HST on the assignment. And it was just like, who knows, no one knows, you gotta go through some sort of like weird analysis. And, and so a CRA changed and said, all assignments, if you're a signor and you're selling the property, you're considered a builder and you gotta charge HST on the assignment price. Okay, so HST is charged on Yikes. this amount, the 100,000. That's, that's your profit. You're, you're, you're charging HST on 100,000. So on 100,000, you gotta charge $13,000 in tax. You get charged 13,000 in, in tax. Okay, so part of the agreement or uh, the order form includes a section for HST. Is it included in or not, yes. right? And that's where we'll get to it. That's where it's important if you, you include it in or not. Uh, so assignee, uh, pros and cons to assignee. So assignee, uh, they you know usually get their occupancy fairly quickly. Typically, uh, assignments are done before occupancy, a few months. You do the assignment, you move in, a month, two months later, three months, so you get your nifty <coughs> cookie. You don't have to wait, you know, like six years or four years to yeah. let the place to get finished. Um, you get you know all the warranties as a new build. You know, carry on the warranties for appliances for the two years for the unit, heating, electricity, all that stuff. Um, you get a, a chance to do your PDI as long as the assignment's done before occupancy. So you get to see the unit, you get to uh, decide what's wrong with it, what's not wrong with it. Um, when it's done after occupancy, someone else already did it for you. Maybe they missed some stuff. Uh, too late now, you can't argue it. You know, so sometimes it's better to buy an assignment before occupancy rather than after, if you're gonna be living in it yourself as an end user. If it's a rental, kind of sometimes don't really care, right? The tenant's gonna come in, I'm gonna live there. Um, you you know, if, if it's done, if the occupancy is done after occupancy, you get a chance to actually go and see it. Uh, because if it's done before occupancy, you can't actually see the unit. So there's some pros and cons to that from the assignee's perspective, they really wanna see the unit. So you gotta decide, you gotta to talk to them. Hey, like, do you care if you don't get to see this unit? You know, it's important to you to see the unit because if it's important to you to see it, we gotta look at only assignments that are in occupancy already. You know, you're not wasting your time running around the city looking at, play, the, trying to find the outside of the building that you can't even go into, right? Um, land trans tax payable on the original purchase price uh, net of the profit. Um, and then, the cons, basically lenders may not finance the assignment profit portion. Uh, this is sort of changing now. A lot of lenders are doing the assignments on the full assignment price rather than the original purchase price. Um, so again, but you gotta make sure, right? You gotta go to your lender, make sure that it's not gonna be an issue because there are some lenders still out there that won't do on the full purchase price, they'll do it on the, on the assignment price or the purchase price. And then also at the moment, what's happening is the appraisals are coming far under Right, so you got to make sure that any difference that the buyer has to bring in has the ability to bring that extra money in. If if you know if the appraisal comes in below what the original purchase price was, you know, like if units were being purchased for like fourteen hundred dollars a square foot and they're being priced at a thousand dollars a square foot now, what do you think the appraisal is going to come back at? It's not going to be coming back at fourteen. It's going to come back at a thousand. Right. So that difference, you gotta you gotta figure that out. Whatever the price is, I'm, I just gave, I don't know if that's what they are. I'm just saying that you know. That's an example. So the one, the assignments that are at a loss, at a loss for a reason, right? And um, so you gotta just make sure you can get financing on that and have the money to bring in and all that stuff, the difference, whatever it might be. Um, and then, uh, you know, one of the cons is if you really want the unit, the assigner might want to have their profits paid in advance along with the original deposits, a large sum of money that you have to pay all at once, okay? So you have to have the cash for it. 
um, and then the HST rebate. Um, I, th this is where we were just talking about the HST with the twenty four thousand dollars. If 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 it's if the assignment's done after occupancy, um, almost always the builder will say you will not get the HST rebate. We're not giving it to you. So on top of the assignment price, you got to pay the twenty four thousand um, dollars. You may or may not get it back from the CRA afterwards if you apply on your own. You say, look, I'm actually living in it. No one's lived in it. Um, but the CRA will usually turn around and say no because we don't know from occupancy until when you actually moved into it a month or two later, if someone rented it out or did Airbnb or something like that. And because the rules are, you have to be the first occupant. Now, there's a, there, I've seen a lot of agents be creative with this and they'll put an assign, uh, a clause in the, in the Schedule A that says that the assigner is to provide an affidavit on closing that says that they never uh, occupied the unit, they never rented it, never put it on Airbnb or any of that sort of stuff. I don't know if that actually works with the CRA afterwards because no one ever comes back to me. Once we close the deals, they don't really come back to me and tell me, oh yeah, by the way, I got my HST rebate. I, I have no idea. We basically tell them, you might not get it, deal with the CRA, I don't know what happens afterwards. So I can't tell you if it, if it actually works or not, but I do see it, I do see it often. And what is the official rule that when you take occupancy, uh, then you can rent it out, let's say, what, one year or six months or what is it? Um, after that, uh, you, so you can't rent during occupancy unless you get the consent from the builder. Oh yeah, but when you when you have a okay consent to rent. Yeah, when you already bought, purchase. Uh, so if you bought it and you're and living it as your principal residence, yes, and then you have to live in it for at least a period of one year. One year from okay. final closing to be able to qualify for that HST rebate. If you're renting it as a renter, uh, as, as a as a buyer that's renting the property under the rental rebate program. You give the HST back to the builder on the day of closing. You then apply to the CRA to get back that portion. You don't get the full portion of 24,000 because it's a different formula under the rental program. Um, you have to have a minimum one year written lease in place and some other stuff. Um, so, you know, and then you can potentially get that 24,000 under the rental rebate program. There are two different programs that CRA has. Uh, so, so yeah, so you gotta find out, you know, does this, if you're acting for an assignment, do they have enough money to buy on an assignment? I think that's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. You know? Okay, taxes. We kind of sprinkled them in as we went. <laughs> oh, the horror. Uh, uh, yeah, the horror. It was horrific. Um, you know, I, for many years, people were like doing such a great job with assignments because you know they weren't telling anybody anything. And they just get like 100 grand, no one knew about it. Just went to their account and it was gone. You know, and CRA didn't know and no one knew. And CRA now has changed all this and now it's, you know, they've got these three taxes that you have no choice. You gotta go through them. So first one, HSC rebate, we all know after before, it just has to get done. One, or, one way or another, HSC rebate is gonna get paid by someone or potentially qualify. As long as it's after before occupancy and you've got an end user client, they should qualify for the HSC rebate. It shouldn't be an issue. It's after occupancy that it really becomes a problem. There are some builders out there, the lawyers will not allow the HST rebate even if you do the assignment prior to occupancy. I have no clue why. You then have to go and apply yourself. There's no reason why you shouldn't qualify for it because you're the first occupant. You took occupancy yourself as the assignee. Um, but it's a cash flow issue and dealing with the CRA is a nightmare. Um, so you just got to go through the rigors of it and hopefully you get it. Um, the biggest one for me is the, the capital gain. Has to get paid on the profits. Capital gain always gets paid on profits. Investment property. You buy, you, you buy a rental property, you sell the rental property at a profit, you pay a capital gain on it, right? Um, same thing with assignments. You're making a profit, you pay capital gain on that profit. Okay? Um, HST on assignment. So with HST uh, before, it was if you were considered a builder, you pay HST on the original deposits plus the deposits. Oh, sorry, original deposits plus the profit. And the CRA is kind of, and this is only if you told the CRA. If you didn't tell the CRA, you obviously got away with the internet bid. Uh, but now you have no choice. Um, so basically, um, in our old example, or in our example, if we, if we were going back in time, the HST would be collected on the hundred thousand, which is the profit, plus the seventy-five thousand dollar deposit, which comes out to a twenty-two thousand dollar tax. HST that you got to collect. So your hundred thousand dollar profit, you got twenty-five thousand dollar capital gain, you have a twenty-two thousand dollar HST. 
you get thirty six thousand dollar commission. You're left with like I don't know ten grand, <laughs> right? It was a terrible investment. <laughs> uh, well, actually, not terrible, right? Ten thousand, a hundred thousand dollar original investment deposit, or seventy five. You know, it's over, like I don't know over ten percent. So it's not bad. You did. You should have just invested in, in an ETF or something. But still, um, the new example now is so you if you have a specific clause in the agreement that backs out the deposits, the original deposits. Now you only have to collect HST on the profit portion. So your HST on the profit portion becomes a uh, hundred thousand. I oh know this math is wrong. It's, it should be thirteen thousand. No, the seventy-five thousand. It's basically uh, 13,000. Yeah. Right, 100,000, 13%, 13,000. Okay, makes sense? Just on the profit. Just on the profit. Just on the profit, yeah. 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 May I ask the profit can be calculated also, that, okay, so the, the original buyer, he asked for extra super duper finishes, yes? He, he paid extra money, <coughs> and that can be deducted as a kind of capital improvements, so then, so that's why they sold for more, for instance. Sorry, uh, say again, say again. I mean, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm talking about the, how you calculate the, how, how to eva calculate the profit, yes? Mm -hmm. Because I am saying the original owner, the original buyer, the assigner, he asked the builder for extra finishes and he paid on top of that some um, money, so, yeah. then, so then he had the bigger <coughs> profit because- But remember, that's, that's already included in your purchase price. That's already included in the assignment price. You're collecting 500, Oh, I see. Thousand that's already included in all that. So they will be deducted simply back yeah. yeah. So the profit okay. is the profit, whatever it is. Yeah. Or you put a, in the schedule A that, that will be paid later if you are asking for yeah. the money back. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I, 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 I kind of don't want to go through this slide. It, you know, it's, it's basically what happened. The idea was no one was doing anything. And it was a convoluted process in terms of trying to figure out if you're qualified as a builder or not. The idea is now that everyone's qualified as a builder on assignment and they have to collect HST. Yeah. That's, that's simply what, what, the, what the, the moral of the story is here in terms of the law that's changed. I know one of the other, the other guys in our office, they love talking about the tax rules and it goes into, I think it's too complicated for you guys to, to really understand. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm going to skip all this. Um, yeah, and, and I'll just point out one thing at the, the bottom, the very last bottom part here, you know, it's it's are you considered a normal course of business? Meaning, are you an investor? Do you have three properties that you bought and you're trying to sign all three and you're doing this every year? To me, that's considered an ordinary course of business. You're, you're doing this for a business. This is no longer just a one-time assignment. You bought one unit thinking you're gonna move into it. Maybe you're gonna like rent it out, but you can't. So you do the assignment because you want it to get out. But if you bought a multiple units and you're doing this multiple times, you're now doing this in the course of ordinary business and trade which now means that you also have to get taxed as, as uh, income, not capital gain. So now your capital gain becomes an income. So if you make $100,000 on each one of those properties, and you made you bought three and you made $300,000 on each of them, now you have $300,000 of extra income that came in that you have to pay tax on that at like, I don't know, 48% or whatever it is. So $150,000 tax rather than 25% of that. So it's just the bigger tax that you're paying, that's all. Do you know if CRA ever went after those guys that had multiple assignments? I have no idea, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Probably not. I mean, CRA yes. created, they created a whole depart audit department for this stuff, you know? And they were, they were they're, they're going out there for people to, to get these taxes for people. So this is a new section um, that they've created you know, essentially, you know, you've entered into, and then the idea with this is that, you know, even if you're in a regular, not a new build uh, scenario, but you've, you've sold a home and the, the seller, uh, or you want to sell it, the, the new buyer wants to sell it to maybe another buyer. So you got a resale home, buyer and seller, and the new buyer wants to come in and take away the contract from the, from the buyer. That's also an assignment. You can do that. That's totally fine. Um, it also falls into these these new rules with the HST and capital gains and taxes and all that sort of stuff. The same applies to land because I, I when land, I was selling land, I, I was part of the like four transactions at the same day. Yeah, all of all land, <laughs> um, mobile homes, 
Um, it's like all of those are, well, flips are different. Flips, yeah. you're just buying and selling, you're renovating, you sell it a month later, six months later. There's other tax rules for that. There, those are, there's a new flippers rolling out uh, for CRA. Um, this is just for assignments. Um, so basically, essentially, you, you know, you're, you're selling an interest in a contract to someone else. It's an assignment. There's a profit. You got to pay the tax on it. Okay. So basically, the formula is written down here. Um, again, essentially, it's the total payment that's been made minus the original deposits, profit portion that gets taxed based on HST, the 13%. So the bottom line is, you have advice. Talk to their account. Talk to their accountant, that's the most important thing. Yeah, always talk to your accountant. We're not tax experts, sure. I'm not, you're not. We're not, for sure. Just be aware that it exists and ex and let them know that there's there's all these tax things, HST, capital gain, talk to your accountant, what you're gonna have to file, because you gotta do some math to realize what your actual return is. Before you take on that assignment. Yeah. Like, do some rough math with them, you know? Like, if we're gonna sell this at 500,000, and your original green person is four, profit's 100, here's the HST, here's my commission, Here's the capital gain. This is what you're going to be left with. You know, are you okay with it? All, all that's assuming assignments for life, right? All that's assuming it's assuming assignments for life for the builder. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so this is where it's also important. Um, this is where it's also important. The the section HST in the agreement, uh, section six, I think it is. Um, is it included in or in addition to? So if you're gonna have to, if the, uh, we all know a sign or has to pay HST, if it's included in. But if you say in addition to, now the assignee is responsible for that HST. So who, who in the negotiation, who's gonna pay that HST now? You can negotiate that potentially. I've never seen an assignee pay for it, but <laughs> there's the option of putting in addition to uh, and see where it takes you. If you're acting for the assign -off. Uh, sorry, so this is, that's what, that's what this is, right? Uh, yeah, so paid, uh, paragraph six of form 150, that's the, you gotta, you gotta mark, is it included in or in addition to? Again, another discussion to have with the assigner if you're selling on an assignment. And this is the HST rebate, essentially. This is not the HST rebate. No, that's that's not, not the, that's this is the HST as the part of the assignment. Sale yeah. of the assignment. The sale of the assignment. The yeah, the 13% on the, on, the on the assignment itself. No, on that hundred thousand, yeah, like the whatever the profit, whatever, yeah. the, profit. whatever the profit was, uh, right? It's always yeah. profit plus additional original deposits always have to be used to calculate the HST. But if you have a clause in the agreement that says we're going to take out the original deposits out of that calculation, yeah, remember this form allows us to do that. B yeah. is B is the original deposit. You just pay yeah. a hundred hundred. Now you just pay HST on a hundred thousand. So clause six included in addition to relates to this. HST that has to be collected on the 100,000. Either in addition to, a assignee pays for it, included in, assign or pays for it. So the agent is on put it, but at the end there, there will be HST. There will be HST. One way or another there's gonna be HST, you gotta decide who's paying for it. This isn't a resale where you can be exempt from HST. There's no exemption for HST on this, this type of transaction. So on a, on a resale of a home, there's an exemption. You don't have to worry about it. it included in it, there's two, it doesn't really matter. It, it, there's no tax, if, as long as it was uh, used as a residential home. Hmm. Though I've never seen a real estate agent put an addition to on a resale home, so let's hope that never happens, because if it turns out that there's tax, it's uh, not good. <laughs> um, so this is, you know, we're, like, we're, not, we're not sure if this clause works, um, this is a clause that we've kind of created that confirms the excess here are that the original deposits are being deducted from that formula, from the, from the payment, okay? Um, so that's, this is why, this, this is important. You need to have this kind of clause in there to reduce that HST that the, the from, remember it was 22,000 versus 13,000, <coughs> okay? Um, so if we go back to this, here, if you put 175 here, which is what most people do, I don't know why. If you put 175 here, HST is calculated on the 175. That's huge. But remember, if we're deducting the original deposits and we're only paying on uh, on, on the 100, 
on the profit, and then we should be putting the profit here. Because it also makes sense in terms of what's left to pay. If here we've said that this is going to be paid at the time consent's given, that's already been dealt with. That's the, we don't need to worry about that math anymore. It's been taken care of. Now we just got to worry about the profit minus the original deposit that was, or not the original, the deposit was put down as part of the assignment. What's left to pay from the profit? And then this, when you go and submit to your C, to CRA your your documentation, this is now going to say a hundred thousand. And that clause is going to show that seventy five was removed, and that's why it's only a hundred thousand. That's why it's important to keep this separate from, from this now, in my opinion. Um, this now changes a little bit when there's a, 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 a loss because this math kind of becomes a negative. And, and this is really where the money is coming from. It comes from the original deposits. And so here should always state as otherwise stated in the agreement because in the agreement now, you're gonna to have to do the math in terms of where is the loss coming from. It's no longer a profit, right? Now it's a loss. The loss has to come from, from the original deposit that you're gonna to pay to them. So instead of paying them um, 75,000, you're paying 75, you've already paid 20, and they gotta pay you, let's say it's a $20,000 loss, they gotta pay you another 20. That's a total of 40,000 deducting from the 75. Basically this number here becomes 35. So if we're selling at a loss of twenty thousand, so if this is three eighty, this stays four hundred. This is three eighty. Four hundred minus three eighty, obviously, or three eighty minus four hundred is, is a twenty thousand dollar loss, right? So here you would have to put minus twenty thousand. So there, there, technically speaking, shouldn't be any HST because it's a loss. There's no money. Um, as long as you have the clause that says 75 is not part of it. So we, we're, we start at a $20,000 loss. $75,000 we have to give back to the assigner. They want their $75,000 back because you're gonna get it as a benefit when you go and buy from the builder. So we gotta give them 75. You've already given 20,000 to secure the assignment, right? So 20,000 here. So 15. when you do the math, right? 75 minus 20,000 is, is 55. Minus 20,000 that you've already given is um, 35. This becomes 35. You only have to pay 35. You've already given 20. There's a $20,000 loss. You only have to give 35 now. That's, that's how you do it when it's in a loss. So it's just, just putting here negative. Negative 20. So what do you mean? HST for the original assignor. No, and then the assignor doesn't have to pay HST because there's no money that's or been really. Gain, no uh, yeah, no, there's <laughs> no capital gain really. There's no cap, like everything is just like at a loss. So it's, there's nothing to really worry about. Um, now, if he's operating a business of buying. But if he's doing this multiple times, like I had a guy, he bought uh, uh, 10 townhouses in a, in a project. It was like a 200 townhouse project. I don't know. Um, he bought 10 of them. I mean, he didn't profit on any of them, he lost on all of them, but if he had <laughs> profit on all of them, um, he would have had a lot of HST to be paying and a lot of uh, income, would have gone towards his income. This is actually it's very important with realtors, because realtors do this, right? They'll buy, they'll buy like two, three units at a time, and then they'll go and assign them. You know, and you can get caught under the, this is the regular course of business and trade. Now it's income, it's no longer just a capital gain, it's income. It's part of your income as a realtor. Um, a lot of people forget this. And now that you're forced to basically disclose this information, um, you're gonna most likely get caught. And the builders, uh, in their agreements, the original agreements, are allowed to disclose any information to the CRA. There's a clause that basically says you're allowing them to disclose any information as part of this transaction to any government agency. So if the CRA comes and starts knocking on the door of the builder saying, I want to know which are all the deals that you guys did assignments on, they're going to the CRA and the CRA is going to audit everyone that did assignments on these deals. So,
But it could be the, the buyer is, is like corporation too, yeah, it's like a then. Uh, yeah, I mean with a corporation, any, any then they anything go, that you buy in a corporation is always capital gain anyways, right? Yeah. So it's the same tax. Then I would from. find out the, uh, where is the corporation, right? The address and who is the, whatever. Or they, or or after. One way or another, you're gonna, you're, they're going to know who you are, the CRA right? is going to. have an army, yes? <laughs> yeah. You can't escape them. So if you, do you think like, uh, when we work with you guys, like if we're gonna, gonna if we're gonna put an offer representing the assignee, can we actually call you guys and get some yeah. either a review or some clauses to yeah. make it strong enough, like you mentioned at yeah. the beginning? Yeah. So there's like I said. So the the, the basics are. Uh, when, remember I mentioned earlier that they're complex, but they don't need to be. You don't need five pages of Schedule A's clauses and conditions and all kinds of other stuff. You don't really need that. There's there's basics. You need to know what the closing date is. You need to have this clause for the deduction of the original profits. Maybe something to do with your commissions in terms of when they get paid, if they're being split a specific way. Um, you need to mention when the original deposits and the original and the profits are being paid. You need that indemnity, the two indemnity clauses I was talking about earlier, and you need conditional clauses for review both a sign or a sign in, financing, maybe an inspection if you go and actually view the, the unit, you know, if, if it's built and you can actually go and see it. Um, but beyond that, you don't really need much more. It's, it's all about the money and the liability. Okay. There's no, like I, I get assignment agreements with all kinds of stuff in them, reps and warranties for, I don't even know what, it's like, <laughs> where'd you guys even get this stuff from? Um, you know, so, it's not, these aren't complicated agreements. They don't have to be complicated. You don't have to make them complicated. They're very simple agreements, uh, concept-wise, right? And so if you keep that, those main uh, ideas uh, and have like two or three clauses that talk about, you know, like for closing date, you can have three different precedents for yourself, right? Is it at the final closing? Is it at part of like, original deposits, uh, occupancy, or consent, sorry, and then final closing. And then is it a weird payment plan, right? Like those are three clauses, create a precedent for yourself, and you know in that scenario that's what you're gonna use. Because that's, financially, this is what we've agreed to, right? Yeah. Oh, and then, sorry, and the caps, if you wanna further cap some of the adjustments, if you want. But those are like really creative stuff that you probably wanna do after the lawyer's reviewed it and said to the client, FYI, none of these things are capped. So like, you might want to go back to the realtor and say, hey, can we say that I will pay the first $10,000 of adjustments and you pay the rest? Um, I find that's a really great one. And uh, no, one, no one tends to use it, but it, it, it works. It works, because like, if, if, a, if a signer really wants to get out of the deal, they will, they will agree to something like that, usually. And then we can list, the, let's say we represent a, a signer, and if we can we can list this on MLS, yes? No, yeah. no, no sorry, this wasn't part of my presentation, no. Yeah. Uh, you cannot list, so in, in almost be. every agreement, builder agreement, it says you cannot assign the transaction without the consent of the builder. Oh, I see. And, and then if they add an addendum, which says you cannot do it, will consent to it under these conditions, one of those conditions is not to list on MLS or any other public listing service or publicly or some sort of public website. Like they just go crazy with the wording, right? So you almost have to find these deals on your own, within your own internal network, within your brokerage, exclusive with other listing. friends, realtors that you might have. Exclusive listings is MLS. But exclusive no, listing it's not MLS, that? but we no longer can do exclusive listings. Only three days, that's all we can do. Ah, so yeah. it's irrelevant. Yeah, just, yeah. Yeah. But I there see are on Facebook all the time. So there are, there the are, are a public uh, mediums. Yeah. yeah. So we are not supposed to. No, because in the builder, if there's a team in the builder's like office that goes and scours yes. the internet for, you know, yeah. any well, cray. They're, there not, so they're, not many. Putting, they're not putting the unit. They're yeah. putting the building, but not Yeah, but they could reach out and say, hey, What's going on with this one? Can I, can I submit an offer? You know, and then they start talking with you, and then you realize. I see thousands of them. You know, you they'll they'll they'll, they'll be like, "What's the unit number? I want to submit an offer for you." Right, and then you be like, you give them the unit number, and now they know. Like, oh, yeah. okay. It's 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 a really risky thing to do that. Yeah. 
Like I, but there are um, uh, websites out there that are that are real estate lawyer, uh, real estate exclu real estate agent exclusive websites. Yeah, Broker those Pocket. are the ones. Broker Pocket is one of them. Yeah. I don't know if you guys have heard of Broker Pocket. Yeah. Pocket. Broker yeah, I have, Pocket. I have an account. Yeah. Yeah. You have an account. Yeah. It's it's free. Yeah. And I was reading these assignments, and you're like, are you that kidding? That is all they do. Yeah. They list assignments. <laughs> And they won't let anyone else in there unless you're a licensed realtor. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so. Um, because before there was listing, like they were listing, this is an assignment sale, I remember. But people this do is it all the time. People do it all the time. doesn't mean that you're, you're, you're allowed to do it. The risk is, is that the builder finds out they're going to terminate the agreement, your client loses their deposits, um, and they have no more rights to that contract anymore. You'd also be fine with RICO, I would think. Hmm. Are you licensed? Maybe, I don't know, because you want to, I don't know, I don't, you just try to sell you really, something that you, yeah, you well, can't have a right to sell, maybe. You were ethical, you were trying to go around the builder. Yeah. I think Rico would have a charge on that. Maybe. I don't know about that, though, because you can't put it on the MLS. You can't actually no, but you, have no, a... No, but you call, you call <laughs> the intent. But what was the intent? That we could go back at it. Yeah, I mean, if, if you... If you are the agent and you are reading that you cannot do it and you do it and you get caught and you force yeah. the termination of the agreement, you bet the, the seller yeah. is going to well, be you really know, angry. Yeah. If I walk into the bank and I have a water bill yeah. and it's painted black, it would go by what's the intent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you know, the ideal scenario is finding it through your network, yeah. not publicly, not Facebook, definitely not Facebook. <laughs> yeah. Or, uh, or, TikTok. or MLS or TikTok or Instagram or any of these things. Um, you really should just be focusing network um, and maybe just, you know, specific um, places that you know the builder's not going to be able to find out that you've, you've listed it. So do builders not know about pop, Broker Pocket? I'm sure they do, but I know the, the guys at Broker Pocket probably screen to make sure. That's their business. If they can't sell on, on that on that platform, what's the point of the platform? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, they're probably interested that they bring some buyers at the end, right? Because that's yeah. And, and also like you, you money, as, right? as an individual, I can't go on Broker Pocket to search for listings. Oh. Like it, it's really you got to log in yeah, and, okay. and you got to. They're probably making money on the assignment fees. I don't, I don't know how they make their money. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean the builder. Normally, it puts a cost per assignment. Yeah. Right. So sure. they're making I don't know ten thousand dollars, fifteen thousand dollars. Yeah. So they maybe they so are ignoring it. They're making money. They just don't want it to go public on it. Yeah. Some no. Well, some of them do make money, but a lot of builders are giving assignments for free too. So there's no fee for the assignment, but you just have to pay for the lawyer fee. Mm -hmm. But there's no fee for the actual assignment itself. Um, and, and builders don't want you listing on MLS because they don't want you to, they don't want to compete against you on all their unsold units that they're trying to sell as well. And they're probably trying to sell them at a higher price than you are. Uh, and then they, they end up being left with all these units that they can't sell, right? And it just drives the price down on, on units in the building. So, like, think, think about it, you know, like if, 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 if there's 40 units that go up for sale in a building, what do you think is going to happen to those prices? Well, they, they keep the best releases towards the end, right? Yeah. The higher value ones. So it's like a supply and demand issue, right? If you got too much supply and no demand, then those prices are going to start plummeting. Well, the builders, what if the builders are bankrupt? Right? The, the, the yeah. cases where they yeah, the other side. Yeah, it's a different story. <laughs> it's going yeah. So, yeah, so that that's, uh, that's assignments. You know, you're scared of us. <laughs> no, we don't, we don't I even. know. <laughs> I don't you said this can be simple, but. No, you say it's simple. It's <laughs> and the best who do you represent? Well, yes. you gotta, you gotta call Edward here and. They are, in my opinion, they are not complex things to draft. They're, they're quite simple. Um, it's, it's, it's all about intentions and having conversations with your client to understand the math. And if the math makes sense, do an assignment. If the math makes no sense, try and find something else to do. I don't know. I don't know if there are other options really. Sometimes it's just that's the only option you have, right? Sometimes it's it, you, you need to get out, and if you don't get out, you're just going to lose all your money. So you, you know, need to do an assignment. After the last time you were here, last month, I had like seven agent calls in a row. I think it was like within a matter of three, four days. 
and everybody was getting, it's like, oh, I'm getting a new listing. Yeah, what are you getting? Oh, I'm assigned this. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> like, why? Jeez. Right? Like, uh, and I'm like, you know, you called me for that too. Didn't you? Mauricio called me right there. He's on that phone call all this time, but he's got, he's got one and a few other people. That's why I was like, we got to bring you back so yeah. you can talk about this. Yeah. Because, you know, our expertise, this stuff. is where, yeah. where it's very sophisticated because we yeah, have to advise now uh, the, the assigner yeah. how much he should, should charge. Let's, yeah. let's say the price is, you know, like whether going up or down, yeah. what is the appropriate... Uh, you know, it's, it's no different than doing a listing presentation for a resale, right? Like, you, you're, you're going to sell it at a certain price. There's a certain mortgage on the property. There's a certain profit that's left at the end of it. It's the same thing, right? You have a sale price and you have these three things you need to talk about. HST, capital gain. Um, HST, really? No, HST and capital gain, the two things. Oh, commission, sorry. Commission, three things. Commission. Don't forget. Commission, <laughs> right? So um, you always you always need to mention about your commission. If you don't mention your commission, they're going to be mad at you. You, yeah. know, you have no idea how many people at the end of a sale are angry when we get through the documents and they see the commission statement. They're like, oh. I forgot. Yeah, they make so much money, and they they didn't tell us about the HST because you guys charge HST on the commission. So on thirty thousand dollars, there's HST of like three thousand something dollars. It's like ah, oh, three thousand dollars extra on top of the thirty thousand. <laughs> so it's important to you know go through these things with them, and, and so they can understand what their profit is. But at the end of the day, if they're making a profit, you know it's 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 good. It's not terrible, but it's becoming worse with all the taxes that they have to pay. Their profits are not as high. Their investments aren't as good as they used to be. You gotta look at it that way too. And some of them, you know, if if, if you take a, the hundred thousand dollar example and you're left with like thirty five thousand, um, was it thirty five? I think it was just under thirty. Uh, it, like it's not a terrible investment if you invested seventy five thousand over four years. I don't know what the return is on that, but it's not terrible. It's not like you lost money still made something could have done the same thing maybe in like other investments or something like that but you could have put it in the market and made 40 percent a year whatever it is whatever it is I, but it's not terrible is what i'm saying you know and people look at that and they're like oh yeah but i was supposed to make 100 but i only made 30 and it's like yeah but 30 but you only invested 75 so it's like a 50 percent return almost <clears throat> in four years not anymore if they're not making a hundred thousand dollars, no. <laughs> I think these days most of them are, are losing money uh, on the assignments at the moment. Most of them are either at break even or close to break even, or or losing. Uh, at least at the moment. They just want to get out. There was a point in time, right, where where prices were crazy, and new builds were selling like crazy, and you know like there's certain buildings that did that are still okay and they did well. But there's a lot of buildings that are not okay. Yeah. I have a client. Uh, he's closing his 25, but he wants to assign it now. <clears throat> so what should I suggest to him? He should wait. In my, in my opinion, I'm thinking he should wait. Yeah. He might pay us up, right? Yeah. He yeah. paid for two yeah. years. I mean, that's part of the, part of the, the game, right? Like, what's going to happen to the market? I don't know. No one yeah. really knows. Yes. But, you know, the timing of the market is not always easy. Uh, these days, at least. Yeah. Yeah, but given the HST and the capital gains and everything else, you should just wait if it's only on the 25th. Yeah. No? It, it, at the end of the day, it's profit-wise, right? Like, can you make a profit now or can you make a better profit in 2025? He's not making it now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, like, it, it, the question now is, will he lose further? That's the other question. Oh, yeah, because yeah. you don't, yeah, you don't know. You don't know. You don't know where the market's going to go. That's wow. the hard part. But we are all hoping that it's going to go up, right? Well, I, I certainly do hope everyone's market goes up because yeah. if it just keeps going down, we're all in trouble. <laughs> well, they have to deal with the deficit. They don't deal with the deficit. The rates are going to go substantially higher. Yeah. There was something in the news. They need to stop spending yeah. money. Well, well they yeah. can't. Americans have to borrow a trillion dollars every two months. Yeah. Within two years, they'll owe 46% of the world debt, and nobody will lend them any money. And that's when you're going to see interest rates start to skyrocket. Any yeah. questions from the online folks? Yeah, what is the question? <laughs> Bruno, Lise, Carla. Yep. All good, sir. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you very you so much. much.
Have a good one. The interesting thing is going to see what happens with no Donald questions. Trump. No questions. <clears throat> I have no idea. Well, he got turned down yesterday for the uh, for the four hundred fifty million. Yeah.